It's great to be back, and we continue now the uh, myths about the Pope, Pope Fiction 2. We'll carry on. There's a few more of the myths. We're continuing with the myths about connected to St. Peter and the early papacy because a lot of the myths originate there. And as I said last week, the myths come down to basically two. The controversy over papal primacy. Did Peter have a primacy? Was he first among the apostles designated by Jesus, basically the Pope, first among equals? And papal infallibility. When the, church, when the pre, Pope speaks on matters of faith and morals in the name of the whole church, and what he says, what I'm going to say is ex cathedra, speaking from the chair of Peter, he won't err in what he teaches. So the, the, most of the myths center around that in different kinds of ways in historical context. Tonight we're going to continue to look at some of these myths, such as tonight we're going to talk about Peter had no successors. And the myth goes something like this. Even if Jesus Christ had given Peter a special primacy, there is nothing in Scripture that suggests that his authority was passed on to his alleged successors. So the task to address this myth involves this. It's to show the primacy of Peter was transmitted from Peter to each of his successors, the bishops of Rome. Now the continuation of Peter's ministry, well, it's tied in many ways to the continuity or the continuation of the apostolic succession. So before we can tackle the specific issues about the succession of Peter and his successors as Bishop Rome, it'd be good for us to outline the biblical evidence for the overarching principle and doctrine of apostolic succession itself. Because we can succeed in establishing that the apostolic succession was intended by Jesus to continue in the church. In other words, the apostles pass on their authority to the next generation of leaders, even after the death of the original apostles, we can also make the case that Peter's unique role as Pope was also to continue as well. First of all, what is apostolic succession? Well, the Catholic Catechism of the Church explains the doctrine of apostolic succession as a perpetual mission intended by Jesus Christ to be carried out in a special way for as long as the church sojourns on earth. Maybe the passing on of the authority from Jesus to the apostles and then on. Now, is there any biblical evidence for the doctrine of apostolic succession? And the answer is yes, of course there is. We know that Jesus intended to pass on his mission and his authority. John chapter 20, verse 21, that great line, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. And you know, you, know, you notice throughout the gospel, like Mark 10, you see Jesus, he sends them already out with his authority to heal people, to drive out demons. Already in a public ministry, he's already passing on this power and this authority and his mission. But at the end, right after the resurrection, we hear him, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Now, the apostles clearly understood that their being sent included their own eventual selection and the ordaining and the commissioning of other men who would carry on the mission after they had died. We also see that indication because Jesus promised that he would be with his church until the end of time or the end of the ages or the end of the world. Since Jesus promised that, we can be sure that the church's need for apostolic authority would continue with Peter and also with the other apostles. And we see that fact in the, in the, we see that in the fact that the powers and duties of the apostles, most especially the duties of celebrating the Holy Eucharist, do this in memory of me, that idea that it carries on. We see that in Luke 24, 14. And the power to forgive sins, John 20, 19 to 23. Those, you see, were intended to be passed on. If this practice was to continue after the 12 were dead and gone, and we know that it did, well then, it's very logical that other people, other men, would have to be chosen for their right disposition and abilities to be able to succeed in that apostolic ministry and being invested with the power and authority to perform their priestly duties. 
Now, there's ample biblical evidence to show that the apostles understood that their ministry would be handed down the church. We see this action immediately after the crucifixion and resurrection. As we well know in the scriptures, Judas Iscariot, who betrayed our Lord, hung himself. What happens almost immediately after, in Acts chapter 1, verses 15 to 26, the disciples gathered, led by Peter, and they choose a successor to Judas Iscariot. It was Saint Matthias. Other actions of the apostle give firm foundation to the Catholic teaching on apostolic succession in this way. They traveled, they were missionaries traveling throughout the Middle East, ordaining successors and leaving them in charge of churches, communities of faith in various cities. For example, St. Paul wrote to a bishop named Titus. He he writes this in Titus 1.5, This is why I left you in Crete, that you might amend what was defective and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Similarly, St. Paul wrote to Timothy, another young bishop that he had ordained, that he laid hands on. And he said this, do not lay hands too readily on anyone. 1 Timothy 5.22. Now, why would St. Paul give Timothy that advice? Because the office of bishop has such a unique and important role and authority that each each bishop needed to be chosen very carefully, choose very worthy men to carry on the special ministry and authority of Christ in the church. And St. Paul emphasizes this point again when he says to Timothy and to Timothy 2, 1 and 2, so you, my child, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you heard from me through many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will have the ability to teach others as well. See, in these passages, we can see quite clearly, Paul and Paul, especially in Paul's epistle to Timothy, the first few links in that 2,000-year chain of apostolic succession. Three points that Paul makes there. Number one, I, Paul, have received an apostolic mission from Christ. 2 Timothy 1, 1. Number two, I've given you, Timothy, this apostolic ministry and authority through the laying on of my hands when I ordained you as a bishop. 2 Timothy 1, 6. And the third point, be careful, Timothy, in handing on this apostolic ministry you possess, handing it on to others, so that they in turn will be wise enough to hand it on to the next generation of bishops, 2 Timothy 2.2. So we see this clear biblical evidence that this idea of our Lord entrusting his authority is what? He wants the mission to go on through the church and be accomplished through the church. To have that happen, the authority he gives to the apostles and Peter needs to be passed on. Now, we have other things. These are not biblical evidence, but they are the writings of the church, early church fathers that lived from the first to the sixth century. They also provide us with a very rich testimony to this doctrine of apostolic succession. Among the many authoritative voices that speak on this issue, one is, and very clearly, is St. Clement. I mentioned him last, uh, last week in my talk. He was Bishop of Rome. In a very simple and eloquent explanation, he he addressed this letter to the Church Church of Corinth. So I explained last week what had happened. The Corinthian community had had deposed, basically, validly ordained priest. Clement writes to them and tells them that not only are they wrong, but they have to restore them, and he's giving an order as the bishop of Rome to do it. This is what he uh, said. The apostles preached to us the gospel received from Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ was God's ambassador. Christ, in other words, comes with a message from God, and the apostles are the message from Christ. Both of these orderly arrangements, therefore, originate from the will of God. And so, after receiving their instructions and being fully assured through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, as well as confirmed in faith by the word of God, they went forth proclaiming the kingdom of God It was at hand. From land to land accordingly, and from city to city they preached. And from their earliest converts appointed men, 
whom they had tested by the Spirit to act as bishops and deacons for the future believers. Our apostles, too, were given to understand by our Lord Jesus Christ that the office of bishop would give rise to intrigues. For this reason, equipped as they were with perfect foreknowledge, they appointed the men mentioned before and afterwards laid down a rule once for all to this effect. When these men die, other approved men shall succeed to their sacred ministry. I mean, it can't get any more clear evidence. Now, remember, Clement is writing when? He's writing in 80 AD. This is that, that's when the letter was sent. He's still living at the time of the apostle John. And as bishop of Rome, Clement was invoking the authority of apostolic succession in this letter to demonstrate not only the continuity of the church's doctrine and the authority possessed, but to teach that doctrine to this community of Corinth. And it's significant to note that Clement was strengthening his brethren. The very command that Jesus gave St. Peter at the Last Supper, when he predicted that he was going to have himself sifted, Satan was going to take him on. And he told him, but when it gets through, I want you to strengthen your brethren. And this is what Clement is doing, strengthening his brethren. He was acting in the same capacity of leadership as Peter was told by Jesus. Now, another significant thing here is that there was never an outcry from the church at Corinth complaining that Pope Clement was out of line for pre presuming to instruct and admonish another preeminent ch church uh, in, in Corinth. No complaint at all. In fact, the clergy restored the original priest. In other words, they, they responded in obedience, and they revered Clement's letter so much that it was read at Sunday Mass. After the readings, Clement's letter was read for the next hundred years. If the doctrine you see of apostolic succession and the primacy of the Roman church was not already well understood by the Christians of the first century, well, there would have been an incredible backlash, but there was nothing, because they recognized this is what Christ intended. There were also other church fathers, such as St. Irenaeus. He was a bishop over in Lyon, France, and in the early second century, he was dealing with Gnosticism. What was going on there was this heresy of Gnosticism, Gnosis, knowledge. A few select had the knowledge, and they would tell you uh, what to do. Kind of sounds like my, some of my government, you know. The Gnosis, we got new Gnosticism. Like other early church fathers, Irenaeus stood that, understood that the sacred ministry of Peter was also to continue through the bishops of Rome. And the way he does that, as I mentioned last week, on another point, Irenaeus actually traces all the popes from Peter right up to his own time. And he established the apostolic primacy and authority with that. He announced that it is a matter of necessity that every church should agree with this church, referring to the Church of Rome and the Pope there, on account of its preeminent authority. In doing this, you see, St. Irenaeus anchored his defense of Orthodox Christianity squarely where? On the rock of Peter, on the primacy of Peter, and the authority that was passed down. According to St. Irenaeus, this is the place where all Christians can be absolutely certain that the apostolic tradition has been preserved continuously. And we have other evidence, even critics of popes acknowledge the truth of apostolic succession. There's one famous one, it's a letter written by Firmian, or Firmilian. He wrote a diatribe against Pope Stephen in a letter to the venerable Bishop of, uh, of Carthage, St. Cyprian. What was happening there is that both Cyprian and uh, Firmilian were criticizing Pope Stephen for his decision about not rebaptizing heretics. When persecution came, people apostatized, they left, some taught false teaching, and they were cut off from the church. And people like Cyprian and Firmilian said they were cut off, so they have to be rebaptized. Pope Stephen re-emphasized the ancient teaching. Once baptized, baptized for all. They need to be reconnected through another process of penance and reconciliation, but they cannot and will not be baptized. Now, it's interesting, Firmilian was very 
very vitriolic in his letter. He criticized severely Pope Stephen, but he did not deny Petrine succession or authority. And then, of course, all you need to do is go to history. You know, I always think of way back, this is years ago, uh, uh, I don't know if you remember Jimmy Swaggart. Anybody remember Jimmy Swaggart? He was on TV. I just remember one time he was just going on and on in one of his teachings. If Peter was the first pope, who is the second pope? And he went on on the thing. He says, there is no other pope. He, if he was it, he should be. I even want to say, I want to call him and say, Jimmy, baby, just go to the Catholic Encyclopedia. Look up the word pope or papacy, and you'll see a whole list of them. Right in line. Peter all the way down to the current pope. From St. Peter to Pope Francis, we've had 264 popes in a row, all in connection, linked to this apostolic authority that was passed down. So we see that Christ intended for his mission and authority to be passed on. It was passed on to Peter and the apostles and their unique authority, and they understood well that it would be passed on at the end of their death to qualified people to continue the mission through the authority of Christ. The second great myth that we're going to cover now is the vicarious filii dei equals 666, the beast of Revelation. It goes this way. The Pope, by the way, this is a, a myth that the very much centered on the Seventh-day Adventist church, but many other people have used it. It goes this way. The Pope is the beast of Revelation 1311 that wears crowns and has blasphemous names written on his head. The Pope's official title in Latin is Vicarius Filii Dei, which translates the Vicar of the Son of God. Now, if you add up the numer numerical value, the Roman numerals that make up that title, you get the number 666, which we know is the mark of the beast in the book of Revelation, the Antichrist. Also, the Pope's tiara is emblazoned with this title, formed by diamonds and other jewels. Okay, let's look at that myth. You know, like other ancient language, such as Greek and Hebrew, some Latin letters are used for numbers. We learned that in our math class. Roman numerals, remember? In fact, when you see the Super Bowl, it, it always will write the number of the Super Bowl in Roman numerals. I is one. The V equals five. The X equals 10. The L equals 50. C equals 100. D, 500. And the letter M, 1,000. So the title, Vicarious Filii Dei, does add up to 666. So I guess that myth is right, huh? How did they get that? Well, you get five for the V, one for the I, a hundred for the C, you don't count vowels, a one for the I, a V, a five for the V, one for the I, fifty for the L, one for the I, one for the I, five hundred for the D, and one for the I equals six, six, six. So I guess that is right. Well, the first problem is that vicarious filii dei or the vicar, the son of God, is not now and has never been an official title used by the Bishop of Rome. The second problem is that the papal title vicarious filii dei is just a fabrication. It was made up, constructed, kind of like the Russian collusion, made up. Now, one of the Pope's official titles is Vicarious Christi, the Vicar of Christ. But that title only adds up to a measly 214, not the infernal 666. In fact, none of the Pope's official titles, says, such as Servus Servor Servorum Dei, Servant of the Servants of God, Pontifex Maximus, the Supreme Pontiff, the Supreme Bridge Builder, that's a Pontifex Maximus, or successor Petri, successor Peter. None of those official titles add up to 666. And that, by the way, is why you'll never see someone who's trying to promote the anti-Catholic myth 
why they never use those titles, even though they're the official titles. So if any person ever makes this claim about uh, the title of Vicarious Fili Dei makes up 666, ask that person to furnish you an example of the alleged title being used in some official way by the Pope. Ask for what document. Where do they get that? They won't have it because you won't encounter any papal decree, any conciliar statement, or any authentic official Catholic document which the Pope calls himself the vicar of the Son of God. No example exists because it's never, ever been the title of a Pope. Now, during the 2,000-year history of the Catholic Church, there have been a few times, a few examples, when the Pope has been described as the vicar of the Son of God, but not by that title. Catholics don't claim that popes have never been, at one time or another, described as the vicar of the Son of God. See, that's not the issue at hand. The issue is, is that the vicarious filii dei has never been a name or official title of the pope. Now they counter, especially the Seventh-day Adventists counter by saying, well, well, wait, Pope John Paul II, his book, Crossing the Threshold of Hope. In the first chapter, page three, John Paul II states, the pope is considered the man on earth who represents the Son of God. So if you translate the phrase represents the Son of God into Latin, you get vicarious filii dei. Well, obviously, they didn't take Latin like Lee and I did, because the fact of the matter is a bad Latin translation. Represents the Son of God, when translated directly from Latin, is filium dei represents, representat, not vicariously fee dei. Represent, you see, is a verb. Vicar is a noun. Well, then the Seventh-day Adventists will counter this way. Hey, but vicari uh, vicari uh, vicarious vili dei it can be found in the Decretum of Gratian and the Corpus of Canon. Now, the answer to that is, yes, they can. Those two references are, are historical documents. They come from another historical document called the Donation of Constantine. Problem, it's a forgery, a very famous forgery. Anybody familiar with the medieval church history will know that the document, Donation of Constantine, is one of the probably the, one of the best known examples of a forged ecclesiastical document. And it's such, so, as such, it can't be regarded as an official Catholic document. They'll counter again, the Seventh-day Adventist, but vicarious fili dei can be found in Lu Lucius Ferraris' book, Prompta Biblioteca, which came, contains an instance of the title in question. And the answer to that is, yes, Lucius Ferraris, his work, Promta Biblioteca contains the title in one of his writings, Vicarious Fili Dei. But again, when he uses that title, it's a, he's using it as a description of the role of the Pope. And again, he used it because he based whatever he was describing on the donation of Constantine, a bogus document. Scholars state that Lucius Ferraris could have been more careful in his use of sources, but nonetheless, this example can in no way be regarded as an instance of vicarious fili dei being used in an official Catholic document. Also, when the Seventh-day Adventists quote the Catholic Encyclopedia article about Lucius Ferraris' use of vicarious fili dei, which you'll notice when you read their, their literature, when they quote it, they only quote a part of it. They skip the final statement of the quote. And this is what they skip. This supplement serves to keep up to date the work of Ferreris, which will ever remain a precious mine of information, although it is sometimes possible to reproach the author with laxism, which means Lucius Ferreris could have done a better and more accurate job in communicating what he was trying to say. Now, you think, okay, that solves the problem about the myth of this, this myth, that we kind of, kind of uh, destroyed it. Unfortunately, the Seventh-day Adventists, they continue propagating this. But I want to tell them, look, if you really want to find out about this, why don't you go to the Catholic Encyclopedia, to the section on Pope, Primacy of Honor, Titles and Insignia. Under the subsection of Official Titles of the Pope, 
The phrase vicarious fili dei is nowhere to be found because it is and has never been an official title of the Pope. One last thing they will uh, speak if you're ever talking to them. They'll say, yeah, but you know what? And sometimes other Protestant groups do this. They'll say, but this title was used in 1915 in an issue of our Sunday Visitor. And it claimed the papal mitre is inscribed with the title Vicarious Fili Dei. And it's emblazoned in diamonds. Well, that's been passed on. Uh, they've done an extensive record of that. They can't find that particular issue. But the president of our Sunday Visitor, he did write a letter to the head of the Seventh-day Adventist and he basically explained that that 1950 issue that had that word in it, it was an unintentional, unfortunate error that the newspaper staffer made. And it should not be used as evidence to support their vicarious feely day. And also, as good as maybe the Sunday visitor is, it is not an official Catholic document, huh? And what about the charge that the Pope is the beast of Revelation because it wears a crown. Because Revelation 13 says, the beast wears crowns and has blasphemous names written on his head. How do we answer that one? Well, this way. Since about 708, many popes have worn at non-liturgical ceremonies a very special papal crown called a tiara. Huh? But this stylized kind of beehive-shaped papal crown of three diadems that we've come to know as the papal tiara that only started in the 14th century. And although it was customary for these tiaras to be kind of decorated and crusted with jewels and other precious ornaments, there is no evidence. I'm talking about no statue, bust, painting, drawing, or even a written description of any of the many tiaras that were crafted that any papal tiara had the name or title of the Pope, Felix Dei, uh, Felix, uh, uh, Vicarious Felix Day emblazoned in jewels on it. That's significant because, you know, when you think through our history, and we're going to, as we continue Pope Fiction in the next year, uh, it's significant because, you know, we know about a lot of the medieval and Renaissance popes who had extravagant tastes and were extra, uh, extravagantly van, vain, and they prompted them to have very lavishly or, ornamented, jeweled, encrusted tiaras made for them. And we possess paintings and statues and other representations that they wore these things. And if any pope would have worn one with that a title on it, it would have been one of these guys. But no pope did. You know, one particular anti-Catholic track shows a metal tiara with the title Vicarious Fili Dei written in diamonds across it. But the fact of the matter is it was a drawing. It wasn't a photograph, it wasn't a museum piece, it wasn't a photo of a painting or of a tiara, it was a drawing, someone drew it. So the fact is, there is no historical evidence that a papal tiara had ever had the title of Vicarious Fili Dei emblazoned on it. One last thing, they're so insistent about using Roman numerals and calculating that Vicarious Fili Dei, not a papal title, does have the number 666, therefore the Pope and his successors are the beast, the Antichrist. Well, using that same math exercise that we did earlier, it is interesting to note that the name of the woman who started the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Ellen Gould White, her name also adds up to 666. L, L, V, L, D, V, V, and I equals 666. Do you think maybe she could be the beast of Revelation? The third myth that we're going to talk about is connected to the book of Revelation. The myth, the whore of Babylon and the papacy. Myth goes this way. In the book of Revelation, the whore of Babylon is described as the city that sits on seven hills. Revelation 17.9. The seven-hilled city obviously is Rome the headquarters of the Roman Catholic Church and the papacy. It is clear then that the whore of Babylon in Scripture is Roman Catholicism and the papacy. Now this myth traces all the way back 
to the Protestant Reformation. Many, many uh, writings, books, engravings have this myth. How do we go about looking at it? Well, first of all, you know, you don't want to, uh, you don't want to discount the truth. We, we, are, we are open to all truth. There is no denying that the city of Rome is famous for its seven hills. No question. But does that prove, then, it's the whore of Babylon? No. Why? Because there's problems with that. The first problem is linguistics. See, to begin with, this myth makes a huge and unfounded leap based on linguistics. The Greek word used in Revelation 17.9 is ore from the word dros. And in scripture, oros usually means mountain, not a hill. I'm talking about a mountain, not little hills, a mountain. You'll see why this detail is real important in a moment. Now the word mountain does not have to be taken literally. In fact, in the Bible, a mountain symbolizes different things. Obviously, you know, on the Mount of Transfiguration, it was a place where God manifested himself. And a mountain is where the Ten Commandments were given. But a mountain often symbolizes a kingdom. And the number seven in the ancient languages represents a perfect number, completeness or fullness. So, just taking the fact that when you say a seven hills, seven mountains can symbolize any number of things. It could symbolize one kingdom. It could symbolize all the power of the world. It could symbolize that the whore of Babylon reigns over all the kingdoms of earth. Therefore, just because Rome, like other famous cities, has been known for seven hills, that doesn't necessarily mean that St. John was speaking of the city of Rome in Revelation 17. He could, when you think about it, he could have been referring to a city much closer to his own experience. Has anybody been, been to Jerusalem? Seven different kinds of hills around, mountains. He could be referring to that. Now the second problem with this myth is they equate Rome to Roman Catholicism and to the papacy. So let's presume that it is Rome about which St. John is speaking in the book of Revelation. The problem comes when pro uh, Protestant polemicists make the assumption that the city of Rome equates to Roman Catholicism and to the papacy. I'll tell you where we see this assumption. David Hunt wrote a book called A Woman Rides the Beast. And this is what he writes. Against only one other city in history could a charge of fornication be leveled. That city is Rome, and more specifically, Vatican City. That comes from page 69 of his book. And David Hunt continues. Numerous churches, of course, are headquartered in cities, but only one city is the headquarters of a church. Vatican City is the heartbeat of the Roman Catholic Church and nothing else. That sounds pretty convincing. But what David Hunt fails to mention is the fact that Rome, the city of Rome, and Vatican City are two separate and distinct cities. You know, we do know that Vatican City is its own city-state, you know, has it had its own money, its own post office, its own army. So the fundamental flaw with David Hunt's argument is the fact that while the city of Rome does sit on the famed seven hills, Vatican City does not. It sits on another hill called Vaticanus, or the Vatican Hill. The seven hills upon which Rome sits are the Quirinal, Aventine, Palatine, Capitoline, Chal uh, Chalian, Escaline, and Vimeo. And that's on one side of the Tiber River. The Tiber River forms a natural boundary for the city limits of ancient Rome. The seven hills were on one side snug inside the city walls. Vatican City, the Catholic Church headquarters, is not built on those seven hills or within the walls of ancient Rome. It sits across the Tiber River on another hill, Vatican Hill. Therefore, since St. Peter's Basilica and Vatican City do not sit on one of the seven hills of Rome, well, this would seem to eliminate Vatican City as a candidate for being the whore of Babylon. And also, you can't jump and equate Rome with Roman Catholicism. It's another leap. 
that is not, uh, not equates. Then some Protestant polemicist, desperate to, sol uh, to salvage the argument, they came, wait, 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 though, but the cathedral church in the official seat of the Bishop of Rome is St. John Lateran, which, by the way, it is. A lot of people say it thinks uh, the Pope's church is St. Peter's. Uh -uh. The Cho Pope's parish church is St. John Lateran, the mother and head church of all Christianity. November 9th is a feast of St. John Lateran. That's what's proclaimed. Caputi Mater, the mo head and mother church of all Christianity, the source of unity. That's the Pope's church. So, oh my gosh, they got me there then, huh? Because St. John Lateran does fall within the bounds of old Rome on the seven hills. The Catholic Church still feel, fits the bill as being based in Rome and therefore the whore of Babylon. I always tell people, boy, you got to give these people an A-plus for effort. It is true that St. John Lateran Basilica is the Pope's parish church, and it's located in old Rome on one of the seven hills. The problem with the argument is this, is that a cathedral is a church building, not a city. And the whore of Babylon is clearly, in Revelation 17, 18, it's clearly a city. You can't mix and match biblical symbols to make them fit your own personal interpretation. That does violence to the text. And of course, even if this last claim still fail, if you make this claim, it still fails to account from the leap from a city to a religion, which the identification of Catholicism with the Horb of Babylon must make for it to work. So therefore, the theory that the location of St. John Ladder and the Pope's parish church is the Horb of Babylon, it fails. Clearly, the Horb of Babylon refers to a city, not a church or cathedral. So the ultimate conclusion about this myth is the city of Rome could be the great whore of Revelation, but so could the city of Jerusalem or many other cities or kingdoms in the world. And even if the whore of Babylon refers to Rome, Rome does not equate to Roman Catholicism. They're two separate entities. Rome's over there, the Vatican headquarters, the head of, uh, and the, the symbol of all Catholicism is over across the river. St. John Lateran is a cathedral, not a city. The Horror of Babylon refers to a city. Therefore, the Horror of Babylon is not, cannot be the papacy or Roman Catholicism. The fourth myth we're going to cover tonight is called the myth that St. Peter never went to Rome, so the Bishop of Rome cannot be the successor to St. Peter. Here's how the myth goes. The Bishop of Rome cannot be the successor to Peter since Peter was never in Rome. Nowhere does the Bible say that Peter went to, there, went to Rome. And St. Paul, who did go there, never mentions Peter being in Rome, not even in his letter to the Romans. You'd think he would say it, huh? If Peter were the Pope, he certainly would have mentioned that he was in Rome. How do we look at this myth? Well, the fact is, the Bible doesn't say Peter went to Rome and died there. But because the Bible doesn't say that, it doesn't mean that Peter didn't go there to Rome and didn't die there. See, trying to prove that Peter did not go to Rome and die there is a lot like trying to prove that St. Mark did not write the Gospel of Mark. That Gospel, like Matthew and Luke, they're written by anonymous writers with no mention of the author's identity. But that shouldn't trouble us, you see, because the external evidence, not to mention the internal linguistic evidence, and the testimony of the early church overwhelmingly corroborates the claim that Mark wrote the gospel attributed to him. So it's true that the Bible does not explicitly say that St. Peter went to Rome, <clears throat> but that shouldn't trouble us either, because its surrounding historical evidence is more than sufficient to prove that he did. Let's look at the thing that there's no evidence that Peter didn't go to Rome. Well, if Peter didn't go to Rome, where did he go? Where did he die? I mean, you would expect that this was the first of the apostles, the first pope. You'd expect to find plenty of evidence in the writings of the early church fathers and the early church telling us where this very prominent apostle carried out his final years of ministry if it were in some other place than Rome. No historical record offers any hint 
that St. Peter ended his days anywhere else than in Rome. No other city except Rome ever claimed to possess the site of his martyrdom or his tombs. And by the way, you got to know that early Christians were extraordinarily diligent about making and proving such claims. No other city, even Antioch, where St. Peter resided for some time during his apostolate, no other city claimed that Peter ended his days there. No church father or church council or any other early church record indicates that he finished his days anywhere else but in Rome. So that's kind of the looking at the lack of evidence side of the coin. The flip side is the mountain of evidence proving that St. Peter did go to Rome. Everyone, everywhere in the early church agreed that Peter went to Rome, ministered there for over two decades, suffered and martyred him there by being crucified upside down in 65 or so AD during the persecution of Emperor Nero. Now, why didn't St. Paul mention him in his letters? I remember uh, I was listening to Carl Keating. He's written a wonderful book. You should have it on your shelf. It's called Catholicism and Fundamentalism. And it's his response to a lot of the, some of these myths and other uh, attacks on the church. And I remember we're listening one time to a, um, to a debate that he had with the, the leader of the Baptist church. And it was down in the Baptist church area. Uh, and the first guy that got up went on to this. Peter never went to Rome. He never was there in Rome. And meanwhile, the crowd's in a fear, you know, just it's like a, at, a, at a football game, cheering their team on. That's right, you tell them. He never went to Rome. He's never, and by the way, St. Paul didn't even mention him. If he was in Rome, he wrote a letter to the Romans. You'd think he'd mention it. <sighs> Cheering. And Carl Keating is kind of like Mr. Peabody, really low key. And he walks up to the microphone. <clears throat> Perhaps he wasn't there that day when he wrote the letter. Oh my goodness, the whole place erupted in laughter. Which, by the way, is a good way, good tool to have when you're talking to people about these things. Have a good sense of humor. Don't try to pile drive people into the ground. State your point, use a little bit of humor. And Carl Keating followed up by saying, hey look, these guys were missionaries. They wandered all around the known world, through the Middle East and the great cities there. So the fact that uh, it's not mentioned explicitly doesn't mean anything. It, may, it means that Paul could have written before Peter arrived. But it doesn't mean that Peter never arrived and never was there. Also, given the hostile uh, government that controlled the known world at that time, the grave danger to all Christians, the fact that St. Paul didn't mention Peter's name or his whereabouts in the letters well, that would make sense. He didn't want to draw unfriendly attention to somebody. It's also, as I mentioned, possible that Peter had not arrived at the time when Paul wrote his letter. But we even see St. Peter making what seems to be a cryptic reference to his presence in Rome when he says this in 1 Peter 5.13. The chosen one at Babylon sends your greetings as does Mark, my son. Two hints there. Babylon was a commonly used code word for Rome among Christians. Why? Because of its pagan decadence and opposition to Christ. To them, it reminded them of the idolatrous wickedness associated with the ancient city and civilization of Babylon. Also, Mark, we do know that Mark journeyed with Peter in his apostolic journeys and was a friend. And many people think Mark was kind of uh, a secretary to Peter, writing to describe his letters for him. So there's a couple hints there. But the fact of the matter, once St. Peter had been martyred, many testimonies of his sojourn in Rome and uh, with St. Paul, they poured forth in a flood from early Christian writers. Perhaps the most detailed of these were the early accounts that came from St. Irenaeus of Lyon. He died about the year 200. He wrote a book against Gnosticism called Against Heresies. And in this book, he gave a detailed account of the succession of the bishops of Rome from St. Peter right down to his own day, 200 years. So what's that? It's 140 years since uh, the time Peter died. 
St. Irenaeus also referred to Rome as the city where Peter and Paul proclaimed the gospel and founded the church. Other early examples of people mentioning this was St. Ignatius of Antioch, who referred to the church at Rome as the church of Peter and Paul. It was in his letter to the Romans. St. Cyprian, in his epistle, number 52, he described Rome as the place of Peter. Now, uh, Antioch lived in the year, one, he died in 107, so you see the closeness here. Cyprian died in 251. St. Jerome, who, who died in 420, he called Rome the See of Peter in his epistle to Pope Damasus. And around the a year AD 166, Bishop Dionysus of Corinth wrote to Pope Soter. He writes this, You all have also by your very admonition brought together the planting that was made by Peter and Paul at Rome. Also, you know, there's a wonderful letter written by, and I, I'm drawing a blank. He was writing to a friend who lived in Alexandria, which was one of the great Christian centers of the ancient world. And he was writing, he said he acknowledged that Alexandria was a very famous thing, but Rome was the center of the church. And in basic in the letter, he said, if you come here, I will show you the tombs of both of them. We have the tombs. This was written in the, uh, in the third century. So there was a great evidence all the way through. And there's also great archaeological evidence. Besides the vast amount of historical evidence showing that Peter went to Rome, modern archaeology has offered even more credible evidence. I'm, I'm fascinated by this, and it'll be part of, I think, another talk I'll do, but uh, you can go to a book called The Bones of St. Peter by John Evangelist Walsh, or another book by um, John O'Neill called The Tomb of the Fisherman. John Evangelist Walsh is a little bit bigger book like this. The other one's a smaller one, very easy to read, but they tell the fascinating story about how they found the tomb of Peter and how all this scientific evidence and archeological evidence and forensic evidence has pointed that what was said that Peter was buried right below the main altar of St. Peter. You draw a drop line from the center of the dome straight down, it'll go right through the main altar, right down to the tomb of Peter. And in 1941, Pope Pius XII commissioned a group of archeologists secretly, because remember, the Nazis were controlling Italy at that time, commissioned archeologists to go down deep under St. Peter's, down about 60 feet, and start excavating. And the reason for it is that Pope Pius XI had died, and they were, Pope Pius XI wanted to be buried in the crypt underneath the main sanctuary of St. Peter. So if you ever go to St. Rome, you can go down into the crypt, you'll see several tombs of the popes down there. And he wanted to be buried there, but the place he wanted to be buried had very low ceilings, so they were digging away, and all of a sudden, whoosh, one of the grounds keepers fell right through and went down, and he fell into this ancient mausoleum. He was terrified out of his mind. People said, hold on, we want to send you, why don't you look down there? Yeah. So they handed him a, a, a light, and he fell into this unbelievably beautifully decorated mausoleum. And... Uh, and he looked around, and so they reported this to Pope Pius XII, and he made a decision to go and excavate. First, he had the archaeologists go to the Vatican archives. Over beyond St. Peter to, if you're looking at it to the right, the Vatican archives go way down under St. Saint, under Saint, uh, uh, Vatican City. There's 91 miles of shell space with all these ancient records. I had the blessing to go under there and to see some of these uh, documents. And he sent the archaeologists down there to study and recorded in history were several times that they broke through. Now why? Because you got to remember Rome fell in the fifth century, huh? The late to fourth, early fourth century. It fell. All the barbarians, the tribes came in, conquered them. And what had happened was they destroyed some of the churches above, but the, the, when Constantine became emperor, he wanted to build a church in memory of St. Peter, and so he literally went to the pagan cemetery, to the place where he was, and he designed the, his basilica to sit right over the tomb of Peter, 
And to do it, he had to cut off the tops of these mausoleums. He packed them full of dirt. They became kind of foundation stones for his cathedral. And he moved literally the Vatican Hill over on top of it to provide the flat foundation for the new basilica. Well, when the barbarians came later on in the fourth century, or fifth century, all that was covered up. The barbarians couldn't, they destroyed things above, but they did, all this was preserved quite pristinely down below. So they, the archeologists studied, they went down, they started going one direction. They found out we can't go that way because one of the supporting walls of the big Basilica of St. Peter, the new one built in the 1500s, would come tumbling down. So they had to go back around. They started following the clues. The clues said that uh, they would come to a red wall. They found the red wall, a retaining wall. Everything fit to all the things and eventually they would find these bones. I won't go through the whole thing because I want you to read the book. They find the bones. What happened was they were, they were not part of the actual tomb of Peter. Peter's tomb was here. There was a red wall and into the wall was a repository. And literally one worker had pulled out these bones, put them in a box. They sat into a, in a shed literally and down below not known to the archaeologists. It's only later than when this woman, who's kind of the hero of the story, Margarita Guarducci, she was an expert on ancient graffiti. And she was studying all this graffiti that was cut into the wall by Christians. And she'd tell them what it meant. And everything was kept pointing, here's the tomb of Peter. And she happened to ask a question of one of the groundskeepers. Hey, do you have any more examples of this graffiti? Oh yes, there was a piece that came right from this part, well, this wall here, this, this little aperture, and a piece fell out and there were some bones. She said, bones? So she went, they found the bones, she put them to a forensic, uh, a forensic scientist, a doctor, who specialized in ancient uh, skeletons. And she herself took the, the words that were scraped and it was said on that piece of stone that had fallen off the wall, Petrus Aeni which is Greek means Peter's in here. She couldn't believe it. So they, she gave these bones, didn't tell the doctor, the forensic uh, archeologist where she found them. She said, I want you to study them. Several years went by, the, the report came out saying the following things. That it was a powerfully built man, an elderly man about 65 years of age of the first century who died of crucifixion. He had overly developed forearms in the Forensic man said either he was a farmer or a fisherman. Margarita Graducci said, how can you tell that? He said, because farmers and fishermen have overdeveloped farms because of the tremendous pulling like, and pushing that farmers have to do. And he said, but I bet this is a fisherman because they had to have extraordinary strength to pull up those wet nets, you know, heavy nets with fish in it. He said he's a first century man, about 65 years of age, a fisherman, I believe, strong, he said uh, there were no feet bones. Well, that would make sense. Because why? Well, he was crucified upside down. Probably the Christians bribed a Roman soldier. He took out his sword and probably just hacked away at the ankles and they carved his body away. But there are no feet bones. But in the examination, there is first century soil attached to the bones. And even more incredibly, the test of the records show that he, his, these bones, when they were first placed there by Constantine, had been wrapped in royal purple cloth. Remember, the purple was the color and the dye of the emperor. No one could have it but the emperor. He was wrapped in that. And, and the forensic studies show that these bones have the stain of this purple dye that goes all the way back. Now, you get to see the whole story. It's incredibly told, like a mystery story by John Evangelist Walsh in The Bones of St. Peter. But Science can only go so far. It doesn't prove that it's St. Peter there, but all the records say he was buried here. All the historical records, archeological records, and scientific things says this is really him. That's as far as we can go, but everything fits in it. Everything fits that here is where he was buried. And so we, we have firm confidence that is the place of Peter because it's right exactly where we said. In fact, when you, if you ever get to Rome, I suggest you have to go online, get reservations for the Scavi tour because very few people go on this tour. They go to St. Peter's and St. John Lateran and St. Mary Major, but they don't go to Scavi because only, they only take 11 people on each tour. 
Okay, 11 people, and they only offer like two a day. So you go online, you can sign up, but it's the most fascinating tour. It's one of the best tours I've ever been on because you literally go down way under St. Peter's and you're walking th on the first century level ground down the street. You're going by one mausoleum after another and you're looking in and they show all these things and they say, look, in this mausoleum, you know that this was a Christian family. How? Look how they painted the sun god. Normally he's just painted with a, 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 a halo around his head. This one had a cross. He said, we know that this was a, a, a Roman who was a Christian. And, and the guy that fell through, remember I told the guy he fell through in 1941? He missed the painting by that much. <laughs> if he went over a little bit farther, he would have destroyed the painting, but it stands there. And um, you go around, you walk around, and they take you to where they find the red wall, and they show you, you can see the actual, there was like one tomb encased by another tomb over the centuries, and you see the different layers of the tomb, and then finally you'll see his, his bones, they were placed in a, an acrylic box. Now they're just back into a, uh, a kind of a gold box, but you can actually see it. And that gold box backs up to the Clementine Chapel. So if you ever get the privilege of having mass at the Clementine Chapel, it's the chapel closest to the bones of Peter. I had friends that just came back from that. I suggest you go on that tour if you ever go to Rome. Make sure you get to that because it is so fascinating. It's like you're walking down a movie set. But you see, everything points to the fact that Peter literally went to Rome, crucified upside down as he asked because he felt he could not be crucified like his Savior. And he worked two decades there, was arrested during the persecution of Nero. He was crucified. Most likely, his feet were cut off, bribed the Roman, dragged him. He was pay, pay, buried first in a pagan cemetery right next to the circus Nero. It was a big circus. Circus Maximus is over that way a little bit. This is closer to the Vatican. It used to run the games and the chariots there, buried in a pagan cemetery next to it. As persecutions began to lessen, Christians bought up more property around the tomb of Peter. And we see on these ancient tombs very direct signs. You'll see a cross and a, a, like an arrow, P to cross, it says from Peter to Jesus. You know, this is the connection, you see. You see all these great signs there. So he, he was there, and then uh, he was taken out uh, at, at the time of the uh, barbarian invasion. Peter's bones, along with Paul's, were taken to the uh, catacombs of St. Sebastian, right along the Via Appia Attica. And they were there, and then they were brought back in the 6th century. And most scholars who study this believe that what they did is they did a fake out. They put three or four bodies in Peter's tomb. And then over here on the red wall, they created a, uh, a, a little enclosure. They put the bones there, sealed it up. So if people came to desecrate Peter's tombs, they would just get Christians, men and women. They found like three men, I think, and a woman in that tomb. The, 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 what they thought was a tomb of Peter. But over here, that's where it said Peter's in here. And he probably did that probably for the future that no one had ever desecrate the, the tomb of Peter. But his bones were there and they were brought back in the 6th century and interred to where they are now. And they're still in that stone ossuary about 30, maybe 30, 40 feet below the main altar. Like I said, get John Evangelist Walsh's book, The Bones of Peter, or John O'Neill's book, The Tomb of the Fisherman. They're a fascinating read. One extra point is that... Um, I was stunned because I didn't know this, but John O'Neill says Pius XII sent one of his monsignors here to, to the United States to a wonderful Catholic man named Robert Strake. He was a tremendous businessman, born in utter poverty, but helped by the church, always grateful to his faith and his church, became a, one of the wealthiest men through, uh, he was a wildcatter. He found one of the biggest deposits of oil in Texas but he literally gave almost everything to the service of the church. And Pius XII sent his man over to ask him, would you fund this? And he gave him a blank check. And they estimate probably it was about worth about the whole effort, about five or six million way back in 1940, which would be tens of millions today. And he did it freely and he didn't take any credit for it, but we owe a lot to him because that's how we found it. So therefore, all this evidence you see corroborates the constant tradition of the church and the unanimous testimony of the early fathers that 
Peter did go to Rome. He labored there for two decades, died a martyr's death, was buried exactly where Constantine said he buried him, and the evidence all seems to point there. Amen. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming.